Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Nabihine Settlement Debrief. Uh, we're very excited to share with you all of what has happened over the the journey of Navahine be the Hawaii Department of Transportation. And just to give folks a few more minutes to join us, we're just going to hold off on uh, just for a few more moments. So please stay tuned and we'll begin shortly. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna get us kicked off. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the very first community briefing that we've done since the historic settlement of Navahine versus Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, we're really excited to be sharing this news with you here first as some of our key supporters who have backed this work, some since the very beginning um, and some who are new supporters to this work. So thank you to all of you. Um, I just wanna start by giving you a quick overview of what you can expect uh, today from this briefing, we're going to be joined by, um, well, you're going to hear directly from one of our amazing youth plaintiffs, um, Riley Brook, who's here with us. Also, Andrea Rogers, who was the lead attorney on this incredible case in Hawaii, and our senior climate scientist, um, Dr. Anders Carlson, who's going to be here to talk to us about the important climate science uh, in that's and um, in what's happening in the state of Hawaii and beyond. So, uh, like I said, I'm really excited to bring you all up to speed on this exciting settlement, and um, it, you know we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about who we are. I know a lot of you already know us, but I want to give you a quick introduction to OCT for folks who are new. Um, we're going to share a little background on the case, why Hawaii, why transportation, and we're going to talk about how we build cases like this, and Anders is going to bring really key insights into the science underlying the case. And you'll hear from Riley Brook on their perspective on the case and their experience of just being a plaintiff in general, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about where do we go from here. So... That's our overview. Uh, so let me just take a step back for those of you who are new to our children's trust and our, our family. Um, I know a lot of you already know us and a lot of you have provided really, really critical support to us over the years. And I just wanna start by saying a really deep um, thank you for that support. We literally could not do this work without you as all of our work is funded by, by individual donor donations like the ones that you give us. Um, and for the, those of you who are new to Our Children's Trust, you know, Our Children's Trust was founded on a couple of key beliefs, but we engage cutting edge legal strategists with award winning scientists and how are young people asserting their constitutional rights to a safe and uh, livable climate? That's the core of who we are. We want every child, every adult, lawyer, judge, policymaker, elected official to understand we have the constitutional right and constitutional rights to a safe and livable climate. We have those rights, we have them now, and we're here to enforce them. We know that our founding documents like the constitution here in the United States or the articles up in, in, in Canada and, and the EU constitution, they were all founded on this principle um, to guarantee essential rights to a healthy democracy. But when they were written, many of them were written without the context of the greatest threat facing children today, and that's the climate crisis. Um, so we go to court to assert those rights because that's our third branch of government's job. Our courts were created to, as checks on power on the other branches of government, like the legislature and the executive branch. And they were created to protect the rights of, of people who are historically oppressed. I don't think I need to tell any of you that in 2024, our political futures in the United States are uncertain. And that's why our children's trust centers 
children's constitutional rights because by creating enduring legal solutions that can't be unwound as soon as a new administration or agency head takes place, we're protecting children and future generations for decades to come. We're inspired by our social movements that have come before us like suffrage, reproductive rights, desegregation, same-sex marriage, and, and we believe that children were a core component. They were at the forefront of all of these rights and play an instrumental role into our advancement of these rights. This time, this path, this, this path of constitutional rights, it takes time to build, but it's our best shot at creating the environment for solutions to the biggest crisis that we face today. And that's the climate crisis. So thank you again. I'm going to let kick this off to Andrea, but thank you so much for being a supporter, whether you've been with us from day 14 or for 14 years, you know, I, I just want to say um, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrea Rogers, our uh, head of U.S. strategy and the, you know, head of the, the legal team on the Navahine case. Thank you so Matt, so much, Matt. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. We're so excited to connect with, with you as our supporters. Um, your support, as you know, means the world for us um, and allows us to do this work and to work with incredible young people like Riley Brook, who you will meet soon. Um, I really want to give you a little bit of background on how the Navahine case came to be. Um, I think while it's unique, given that the case is in Hawaii, it also really highlights how we do our work here at our Children's Trust. We have a number of different cases in other jurisdictions and um, how Hawaii was developed and ultimately um, came to the success of the settlement agreement is quite similar to how many of our other cases are developed and currently being litigated right now. The case is really 13 years in the making um, with our Children's Trust supporting youth first filing a petition for rulemaking on Mother's Day back in 2011 and then working with the community um, of practitioners, advocates and young people to build the lawsuit which ultimately became Navahine versus Hawaii Department of Transportation. That case was filed on June 1st, 2022 against the state of Hawaii and the Hawaii Department of Transportation. The Hawaii Constitution um, has incredible language protecting um, the rights of present and future generations to all natural resources, including land, air, and waters. And there's also a specific provision protecting people's rights to a clean and healthful environment. And the Hawaii Supreme Court, largely based on legal work um, that our Children's Trust founded, uh, has recognized that the right to a clean and healthful environment in Hawaii encompasses the right to a safe and life-sustaining climate system. So the Hawaii Constitution really centered our legal claims um, and gave us a path that we saw as potentially being successful in the state. The reason we focused on transportation was because really the legislature in Hawaii has done a very good job with respect to recognizing what needs to be done to address the climate emergency. And that's to get us to zero greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible. Um, and the youth sought to ensure the governor and HDOT's success in meeting these state legislative goals to decarbonize Hawaii's economy and achieve zero emissions in transportation no later than 2045. So as Matt mentioned, our work is really about enforcing young people's constitutional rights. And here you have a situation where the legislature doing what it needs to do by recognizing the goals that the end goals where you need to go. And what we had was HDOT really falling down and not being able to implement and operate the transportation system in a way that resulted in greenhouse gas emission reductions. Instead, the reason we focused on the transportation sector is we really identified that place as where we could create outsized impact for climate and young people's ability to live so safe and healthy lives in Hawaii. Transportation accounts for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions in Hawaii, 
And those emissions are projected to remain high through 2045 with existing policies in place. It was very clear that without change, the transportation sector would be the culprit behind over 60% of the state's emissions by 2030. Transportation is also really important in Hawaii, as in other states as well. Transportation makes up the greatest share of the state's budget. They get most of state dollars, um, and that's how transportation dollars are invested is a critical aspect of how, how and whether the state is able to address the climate crisis. Finally, what we had seen in doing our research over the years is that a number of other state, federal agencies, other private entities had all pointed at transportation being really the problem in terms of Hawaii being unable to achieve their greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, so the evidence really showed that the policies, the transportation policies currently being implemented were problematic and needed to be fixed. Um, I'm showing you here on, on the graphic are, are some graphics from some of our expert reports that Anders will talk about a little bit more specifically. But this is just one example of a report saying, you know, asking the question, was the Hawaii Department of Transportation doing what needed to be do, done to address climate change? And the answers were clearly no across the board. We knew that if we were able to activate the Constitution and the courts in holding HDOT accountable for decarbonization, it would really clear the way for the state as a whole to protect the rights of youth and offer a national and global model for success successful decarbonization. Before we start diving deeper into the case and the settlement agreement, I want to pause here and introduce Riley Brook, um, a plaintiff in Navahini versus Hawaii Department of Transportation, uh, who just now has entered a 20, 21 year settlement agreement with the state of Hawaii. So is in a very unique role? And Riley Brook, um, you've been such a powerful leader and driver of change in Hawaii. Um, with all of your work and organizations and in Navahine in particular. So can you share a little bit more about why you decided to get involved in the case as a plaintiff? Yes, thank you so much for that introduction, Andrea. I originally started in legislature when I was seven or eight years old. Um, so my parents like to say that I was basically like, that was my second home here, um, was the state capitol and city hall. Um, I was always there testifying for bills. Eventually, that turned into writing my own bills, both at the city and county, Honolulu Hale, and at the state capitol. I also have a nonprofit that Andrea mentioned. It works with youth, um, basically in all aspects, from sports to animal rescue, um, beach cleanups, and even in civics, things like this. Um, so when I heard about this lawsuit, I kind of jumped at the opportunity. Number one, because I feel like I made change in the legislature every other way from making bills um, and revising bills. And I've never been a part of a lawsuit like this. And number two, because one of my goals is to stop irreversible damage. I think growing up, just in my short life, I'm 16 years old. I've seen so many um, issues that the government has made from Red Hill and poisoning our water. Um, and things that truly we could have put our foot down and stopped before it was too late and irreversible, irreversible damage was made already. Um, but that's one of my goals is to stop irreversible damage, not just for the state, but for the world and not just for me, but for my generation um, and future generations to come. Amazing. Thank you, Riley. And what do you think Navahine will now mean for Hawaii's future? You know, we had a Zoom with all of the plaintiffs, and I think something that we all agreed on when we heard the word settling was that we were the ones lowering our standards. So at first, we were very skeptical. We wanted all the information and to know everything. Um, but it's a really great deal that we were able to make with the government. Um, I'm excited for Hawaii's future because I've been fighting so long in the legislature for the government to hear us youth. And finally, the government is saying that they're going to take us seriously. We were able to sit down and talk with um, Governor Green. And he, first of all, encouraged all of us youth and told us, thank you so much for getting involved and that this is something what you really needed. But his hands were tied, so he had to go through um, 
all of his legal stuff, which thank all of our legal team for helping us out with all of that. Um, Y'all did so much for us. Um, But another thing Governor Green said is that he enjoys the youth speaking and getting involved and it kind of um, not really rattles the government officials, but it surprises them that we care about our future. And he said that he sees more youth stepping up and even like young adults in our generation that are now in office. Um, So it's a really great thing. I'm also excited for better use of better use of our funds and resources when building infrastructure um, and progress to a cleaner and more sustainable future. Um, One of the things that the settlement talks about is a youth board that they're going to create. So I'm excited to see youth working with government officials, like native Hawaiian youth working in the government with government officials and being heard. Wonderful. Thank you. I bet you can imagine how incredibly well Riley did during her deposition. (laughs) So I want to talk a little bit about really a key aspect of our work here at Our Children's Trust, which is bringing the best available science into the courts um, and really is the linchpin to protecting young people's constitutional rights. So our work with the top scientific experts in the world is central to everything that we do. Um, In Hawaii, we worked with 10 incredible experts, all of whom were at the top of their fields in climate science, transportation policy, uh, mental health, and they all agreed to provide their services to these young plaintiffs pro bono. And the reason that they did did that is because they believe in the youth and they believe in our mission here at Our Children's Trust. So I'm going to ask my colleague Anders Carlson to speak more about his work and um, our ex- incredible expert witnesses and what they brought to the table in the Navahine case. All right, thank you, Andrea. So um, first off, like what my position is at Our Children's Trust is pretty unique. And the way I describe it, the simplest way or the fastest way in an elevator is if you just think about any other kind of company, they usually have an on-staff lawyer that advises them about all things legal. Well, our Children's Trust is a group of lawyers that have an on-staff climate scientist to advise them about all things climate. I then work a lot with our expert witnesses in bringing forward the best available science to our legal um, uh, cases. And so let's look at where we are now in terms of the planet. And this is a graph showing the last 800,000 years of climate, global climate. And the top is a record of CO2 in the atmosphere. Below that's an estimate of global temperature, and below that is changes in sea level. And to put us where we are, um, 2023 atmospheric CO2 hit a level of 421 parts per million. And that is more than 70 ppm above the upper safe limit for Earth, for the Earth, for humans on Earth, which is about 350 parts per million. And we've been above that limit since 1988. Now our climate now, our global temperature, the last five to 10 years has averaged about 1.2 to 1.3 degrees C warmer than the late 1800s. And in American numbers, it's about 2.2 to 2.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And then also on top, in response to this warmth, uh, sea levels risen globally about up to close to 10 inches. So let's look now at like what's going on in Hawaii. And this is what our experts were bringing forward in our case. And we were going to have experts and our plaintiffs were going to discuss many uh, climate harms and impacts like the fires on the Lahaina, hurricanes, floods, increased rainfall, droughts. But I want to just talk here about a few things that are more very specific to Hawaii. And the first one is marine heat waves. And so a marine heat wave is just like an atmospheric heat wave. It's where the water temperatures are way warmer than they should be for that time of year. And Hawaii is a real focal point for increasing marine heat wave days, as you can see in the upper map there, where it's really red, meaning there's a lot more marine heat wave days occurring there now than there were 40 years ago. And in 2015, Hawaii experienced the largest marine heat wave ever recorded on the planet called the Blob. And this span of lower right map shows you that area there of this large heat wave that was up in the Northeast Pacific. And again, I said, this is the largest one ever recorded and it could never have happened except for human greenhouse gas emissions. This is impossible to have occurred. This is not, there's no natural climate variability involved in this heat wave. And in today's climate, this thing has about a recurrence interval of every 40 years. So we can look now what this did to marine ecosystems. Um, and the one that we can talk about quickly here that's very visual is marine uh, coral reef bleaching. 
And so the top here are two photographs of Hawaii coral reefs taken by our expert, Greg Asner. And one is on 2014 before the heat wave hit Hawaii. And the other one on the right is right after it in August 2015. And the two look very different. And that's because the symbiotic algae on the reef left during the heat wave. So they, they escape, they leave the coral and they go to little areas called refugia, which are local cold regions where they can hide out like we do in air conditioning houses during our heat, atmospheric heat waves. And they then return after the heat wave's done. But the problem is these heat waves are becoming more frequent, stronger, and lasting longer. So if we move towards a global warming limit of 1.5 C, like our governments have said they wanna go to, remember we're going up still to that temperature, it's gonna keep increase the temperatures of the ocean. And so first off, these warmer waters just on average will remove these refugia. So the lower map shows you that 90% of the world's coral reefs will lose their refugia where these little symbiotes can hang out during heat waves at 1.5 C of global warming. And for Hawaii, that's 100%. So when the marine heat wave hits Hawaii in the future, there's no place for these algae to go when they die. And that then kills the reef. And now on top of that, heat waves like the blob, which could never occur, are going to now be occurring every 10 to 20 years at 1.5 C of warming. So it's gonna only get worse if we go towards these government chosen uh, treaty targets. So what's another thing that we can look at then that'll occur uh, as we keep ourselves above that 350 ppm limit is sea level rise. If we go to the next slide there, there we go. Okay, so yeah, and Hawaii being an island state is gonna be highly impacted by sea level rise. And so this is graphs here that would have been shown or taken from our expert witness reports. And we'll just look at the impact to regions that our plaintiffs know and love on Hawaii, on Kauai, Hawaii, and Oahu under just an intermediate level of sea level rise. So this is like the best estimate of where we're going right now on our current greenhouse gas projections, which is a little over three feet by the end of this century. And these locations on these three islands here are shown in pink, and these are areas permanently inundated under the pathway our governments are going on right now. And it's this is permanent drowning of parts of Hawaii. And if we now look at what would happen if we go towards that 1.5 C global warming um, target, that uh, we if we stay at this, we will lock in, because we're well above that 350 ppm limit, lock in sea level rise of nine to 15 feet. And this will drown large amounts of Hawaii's infrastructure. This is an example here of Honolulu. And you can see at the darker shades, like the airport's gone, where our hotel was is gone. And this is just gonna be devastating for the state of Hawaii and most of the world that people live near these uh, coastlines. Now, the best thing is that we had in our cases, it doesn't have to be this way. There is real hope. And the easiest way to get ourselves back to 350 ppm and um, is stop using fossil fuels. And all we have to do is stop emitting CO2 into the atmosphere from our combustion of fossil fuels. And then that allows Earth's natural sinks to deal with our past emissions. Instead of dealing with every year we emit more CO2, they have to suck this stuff up. Instead, they can go after the old stuff. And if you look at the best available climate models, if we end our CO2 emissions between 2035 and 2050, these natural sinks will suck up our CO2 and put us back below that 350 ppm limit around 2100. So this is a very easy way to answer this, um, to solve our problem. And we had experts that were going to testify and particularly Mark Jacobson, who has shown that for the state of Hawaii, all 50 states in the United, all 50 US states, and then for 145 countries, all our energy needs can be met by wind, water, solar, geothermal, and then also hydrogen being produced in, from wind, water, and solar. So we don't need fossil fuels anymore. And we have ways of providing all our energy needs by renewable and clean sources. And this then, if we follow through this, like Hawaii is doing, we will then be solving global warming. And we'll get back to our 350 ppm limit here by the end of the century. And what's really impressive with this settlement agreement is Hawaii recognizes 350 ppm as a safe target for them to go towards. And Andrew now can talk a little more about these um, this uh, historic agreement. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anders. We really appreciate sharing your expertise with us today. Um, so just speaking a little bit more about the settlement, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how much work went into getting us to the end result. 
Um, you know, the case was filed, as I mentioned, you know, many years building the litigation itself. Um, and then after the case was filed, you know, we were engaged, um, the defendants filed a motion to dismiss. We had to really push hard to keep our trial date, which required a lot of legal briefing on our part. Um, we were engaged in the process of discovery for many months um, and trial preparation, including taking and defending a total of 37 depositions, 15 expert and rebuttal reports prepared by our incredible um, experts, um, and the exchange of over 200,000 pages of documents really led us to where we ultimately settled the case just weeks before the trial was set to begin. Um, the settlement agreement itself is really a key victory for our youth plaintiffs and for climate justice everywhere. This agreement shows that we can and must work together with all three branches of government, stepping up to uphold and protect the rights of young people and all future generations in Hawaii to a safe and livable climate. The settlement agreement would not have been possible without um, OCT's legal expertise, the plaintiff's expert reports and deposition testimony, and the plaintiffs themselves sitting for deposition and sharing their stories in a very contentious environment, um, the local work from our partners at Earth Justice and others in Hawaii, as well as a deep commitment and support from the Depar Director of the Department of Transportation, Ed Sniffen, and Deputy Attorney General Kira Kahahane, um, and the Hawaii Attorney General, Ann Lopez, all played critical roles in making this settlement agreement a reality. Um, the settlement agreement in Navahine versus Hawaii of Department of Transportation recognizes that youth do, in fact, have constitutional rights to a safe and livable climate. Um, the parties also recognize that the state's constitutional public trust obligation to conserve and protect Hawaii's natural beauty and all natural resources, including land, air, and water for the benefit of present and future generations. Importantly, the agreement recognizes that the Department of Transportation, when it takes any action implementing the transportation system in Hawaii, it must preserve, protect, and maintain Hawaii's public trust resources and protect the constitutional rights of youth. Um, and as Anders mentioned, the state committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions towards zero using the best scientific evidence today um, including reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide to less than 350 parts per million by the end of the century. In the settlement agreement, defendants agreed to take all actions necessary to achieve zero emissions no later than 2045 for ground transportation, sea and inner island air transportation. One key aspect of the agreement is the development of a greenhouse gas reduction plan within one year from the signing of the agreement that will really lay the foundation and roadmap to decarbonize Hawaii's transportation system within the next 20 years. And it will also serve as a model for transportation systems around the world. Um, they have agreed to reform their budgeting and programming to prioritize decarbonization of transportation. If you don't prioritize and fund it, it's not going to happen. That's really clear what the evidence showed in the case. Um, it, the Department of Transportation has created a new leadership unit that will ensure new policies are implemented, that benchmarks and targets are met in time required to meet the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. As Riley mentioned, um, they are going to be providing youth with a seat at the table, so requiring HDOT to keep the Navahine plaintiffs informed of what's going on. That first meeting is scheduled for, for in a couple of months, um, providing them an opportunity to share feedback um, and to really shape um, the policies that will be implemented going forward. And they've also agreed to establish a volunteer youth council to advise HDOT more formally on commitments in the years to come. One of the most important aspects of the agreement is that the court has agreed to accept what's called continuing jurisdiction. And that's why I said Riley has entered into a 21 year relationship with the state, because if there's any challenges along the road, the court will be able to step in and make sure that the agreement is enforced 
either until zero emission targets are achieved or through 2045, whatever happens sooner. The settlement agreement is really unparalleled in its nature, scope, and length um, in terms of an implementation plan to achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions while simultaneously having court supervision. Um, we're quite hopeful that it can serve as a leadership model for other states and countries around the world um, to address one of the most important sectors contributing to the climate crisis, which is transportation. I think one of the things that really makes this agreement so unique and special is that you have the three branches of government working together to do what needs to be done according to the best science to protect young people's constitutional rights. It's really what we set out and founded our Children's Trust to do. Um, is to activate all parts of our democracies so that we are all working towards protecting young people's rights. And we're really starting to see that in action um, in a very meaningful way. Um, and by reforming their transportation system, Hawaii will be able to really be a model for governments everywhere who are willing to step up and, and do the right thing or who are willing to have uh, courts uh, to play a role in making sure that they do the right thing. So Riley Brooke, just wanted to ask you what you think about um, the settlement agreement and how it feels to uh, have Director Sniffen and Governor Green so responsive. I think the settlement and the terms that we came to was great. Like it's more than we could have asked for. Um, and I wouldn't change anything about it. I think we just came to great terms. As far as Governor Green um, and Director Sniffen goes, I'm happy that we finished our suit with um a good relationship with each other i feel like these past few years we've kind of been going back and forth fighting with each other and the governor putting money aside to fight us um so i'm happy that we were able to come to good terms um and that they kind of at the end took our side even even though the public has a lot of negative things to say about our case just because either, either they don't believe in climate change or they just don't understand the case and they think that we're suing for money. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy that they were able to take our side and take action. And I hope that that's something that more government officials and branches of government do is listen to youth and kind of hear the whole story. Thanks, Riley. And what about this settlement agreement? What gives you hope? I think one thing that people have to understand is that one state making this change isn't going to tackle the entirety of climate change. Um, I'm very hopeful that other states or even countries will use our lawsuit as, as a blueprint for, for more suits to come. Um, because we're the first of its kind, whether it's to sue a specific branch of government, um, like how we're suing just the Department of Transportation, or to sue on behalf of your constitutional right, I hope that other youth and other youth can step up and do the same thing where they live. Um, and I'm excited to see what our Children's Trust helps with next. Thank you, Riley. Matt, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Riley, so much. And, um, you know, thanks for all of your efforts. And I know we just spent some time together in Honolulu celebrating this incredible achievement. But when I reflect back on what I was doing between the age of eight and 16, uh, it was not what you were doing. So um, just want to say thank you so much. And really, again, I'm just like the thank you person today, but thank you to everybody who supports our work. Um, and you know, I just really want to emphasize that as a nonprofit organization, we don't take any legal fees for these uh, cases. We don't sue for money, as Riley Brooke just really articulately pointed out. We're suing to ensure we protect children's constitutional rights. That's what makes it um, uh, so, so that's what makes our cases so powerful. And, and to one of the questions in the, the chat, I think that was part of the reason why we were able to get Hawaii to the settlement table was that we weren't asking for money. But it's so important to have have your support. And I want to say a special thank you to the Dolores Bar Weaver Legacy Fund 
um, who offered a challenge grant of $100,000 and are matching every dollar, dollar for dollar to make this work possible. So, so thank you, Dolores Parweaver Legacy Fund. So I just want to um, talk a little bit about our youth powered litigation strategy and sort of zoom out, right? Like, because this is incredible for Hawaii, but really what Hawaii has created for us, like what Montana created before Hawaii, roadmap for trial and how courts can be involved. Now, Hawaii has created a roadmap for how to implement and execute on that kind of a victory. And I alluded to this at the beginning, but, you know, our federal courts are a bit of a mess right now, and um, and we just don't know what's going to happen. So that's why we are we think it's extra important for us to be taking this fight to state courts. And we have a a state strategy that we are going to be um, you know in, like enacting over the next several years to try to reach a national tipping point. So. How do I describe this? I, usually I talk about this as kind of a rising tide where we're going state by state in really calculated ways, looking at states with clear, clear um, infrastructure investment like Montana around extraction, Hawaii, the state with the number one in investment in uh, transportation, and other states where we think there are critical pieces of legal infrastructure that we can use to secure victory for children's constitutional rights, pointing to a national tipping point, um, informed by, for example, the way that we litigated um, same-sex marriage cases state by state until we were able to secure a federal constitutional uh, right for, um, for marriage equality. So states like Montana and Hawaii, they have express constitutional provisions protecting the environment or a, a livable climate, right? Like you heard Andrea talk about, like those of you familiar with our Held v. Montana case, um, have heard. But what people don't always know is that there are state protections all over the place, right? So this map shows you the kinds of different protections that we can seek to enforce across the entire nation. And that's part of the legal strategy behind um, how we we pick our state cases. Um, and this, this strategy will have immediate results because not only are we looking at the laws, but we're looking at what kind of emissions we can keep in the ground. So if you look at the various states where we plan to bring litigation, these are some of the states that have some of the most significant emissions, um, like bar none, right? And when you, when you sort of total it all up, um, the the total amount of emissions that we stop by bringing this litigation um, is is enormous, right? It's I think you know going back to the Held v. Montana trial, the state kept trying to emphasize. And oh, actually, for those of you who tuned in at the Supreme Court level, the state kept trying to emphasize, oh, this is just Montana. This is so small. This is so small. But Montana has one of the largest coal reserves in the world, not just in the country. And so when we look at the emissions we stop, it's enormous. And can you go to the next slide, Laura? That the litigation strategy, and I just, I think this is so important. This results in the equivalent of more than 19 years of global fossil fuel and industrial emissions. So we're talking about global emissions here. And that's the kind of impact the United States has on, on our climate and why it's so important that we stop each state. The, um, the, and, and the results are clear, right? There are just very clear immediate impacts for winning. Um, an, accumulate, uh, uh, an accumulated total of $1.24 trillion of savings on health an energy bill because we would actually be lowering our energy costs by moving to clean renewable energy. And a total of, this is an enormous number and I always feel silly saying it, but basically 720,000 million metric tons. So just it's just this enormous amount of impact that this case, um, the state legal strategy uh, can have. So before we even um, launch our cases, 
we're behind the scene building these cases, right? And you heard a little bit about it with um, Andrea describing how we built up Hawaii, but an enormous amount of research goes in like that you can sort of see in those maps. We uh, identify incredible youth plaintiffs like Riley Brook and people who are already climate leaders and, and leaders in other social justice movements throughout their communities. And then we're implementing this, you know, cutting edge legal strategy before we even launch the case. And behind each case is also a deep dedication to implementing the tools of trauma informed care. So we use trauma-informed lawyering when we approach the case. And we're essentially injecting trauma-informed care into every step with the way that we onboard our plaintiffs, the way that we train them to interact with the media, how they take the stand. And really that's a lot about giving them complete control over their case, having completely transparent conversations with them and also giving them agency so they know that at any moment they can take a step back, that they don't need to be um, re-traumatized by this, this legal process. And for those of you who have been in the legal process, you know, the, the legal process is a little traumatizing. Um, so I just, I, I just wanted to sort of round us out with that. And I can now move on to some of the, um, the questions and answers that have, or I guess some of the questions, and we'll provide some answers um, as we can. I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. And I just want to remind folks that you can continue to reach out to us with any of the questions that you have. Um, our development team would be happy to field those. Uh, I sh I'm sure you have this email, but I'm going to just say it again. It's, it's development at ourchildrenstrust.org. So um, I'm going to just start with uh, one of the first questions that came in, which was like, what are the other states or areas where OCT has um, brought suits? Well, our children's trust, as Andrea said, has literally brought legal actions in every single state, starting back on Mother's Day back in 2015, when we filed like 50 rulemaking petitions in every single state, which led to the you know, uh, amazing victory in Montana um, uh, 13 years later, and now this incredible settlement in Hawaii 14 years later. Uh, but currently, we have active litigation in several states. We have active litigation in Virginia. Um, we're about to litigate, we're about to go argue before the Supreme Court in Utah in September. We just this week argued before the Supreme Court in Montana. Um, we also have federal cases, like the case that many people have heard about, like Juliana versus the United States and Genesis versus the EPA, where we are suing the Environmental Protection Agency for their use of um, calculations called discounting rate that lowers the value of children's lives when deciding environmental policy. We also just sued Alaska for one of the most, um, I think, egregious projects to be greenlit recently, it would, um, this LNG, this natural gas pipeline um, that they are trying to build would triple the state of Alaska's emissions for decades to come. And we've sued on behalf of seven Alaska youth to stop it. Um, we have cases in other countries like Canada and Mexico, where we partner with lawyers there locally um, and support those cases with, uh, you know, our legal thinking as well as our, um, you know, various connections to make these cases possible. And our global program has been deeply investing in getting science the best available climate science before international tribunals, like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, like the European Court of Human Rights, and the International um, Court of Justice. So we are there testifying before these um, inter uh, um, international tribunals on behalf of pediatricians, climate scientists. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, go to our Vimeo page and watch Kalalapa, one of the other plaintiffs in the Hawaii case, 
provide some of the most powerful testimony I've ever seen in my career um, to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights just a couple months ago um, in Barbados. So one of the other questions, sorry, I'm looking at what was sent to me. Uh, there, let's see, um, what can be done to pivot, to prevent a pivot to natural gas and other false solutions? Well, I, um, thank you for submitting that question. I'll just say that I think our settlement agreement provides a really strong defense to this kind of false pivot. And Andrea, I don't know if you have anything you want to say in addition to um, to this question, especially as there's, you know, the, the, the question goes on to say, as we move forward and the need for electrification increases. Yeah, definitely, Matt. I mean, I think what's incredible about the settlement agreement is it obligates the state whenever they're implementing policies with respect to transportation, they now have to consider and protect the constitutional rights of young people. And it's really clear that transitioning using natural gas as a bridge fuel or whatever you wanna call it, it is not protective of young people's constitutional rights. So um, I we think it's pretty clear under the settlement agreement that that would be a no-go. Um, and I think a, a big portion of the community in Hawaii recognizes that. Um, and I think that message has already been delivered to Governor Green and will continue to be delivered to Governor Green. But one thing I will add is, you know, now that the settlement agreement is signed, really the real work begins. Um, we will be working very closely with our existing experts as well as uh, others and new experts to make sure that HDOT, they get it done right. You know, they really have one opportunity in terms of creating this greenhouse gas reduction plan. Um, and it needs to be done very well. So we will be working very hard to make sure that um, we are advocating for the policies that need to be in place now um, and not solutions that are ultimately designed to fail and that will violate the rights of young people. Thanks, Andrea. Um, it looks like a couple of other questions came in. Um, I saw your question, um, Bob, in the chat about India and Brazil and China. We've actually been in touch with lawyers in India and in Brazil and are trying to work with them to develop cases. We're really concerned um, about the global south and the impacts that the global south is facing despite the tremendous amount of um, pollution that has been foisted on them. Um, by the global north. Um, so I would just say stay tuned for that. And, um, you know, we're going to be, I think, uh, uh, rolling out our sort of new global platform here soon. And um, yeah, it's really an exciting time as we help develop those cases in areas that I think have seen some of the same kind of intractable problems that, um, that the United States have seen recently. And I, and I love this other question. It's sort of, and maybe it'll be the, the last question that I wrap us out on. Like, what, what does success look like? And I just want to take a step back. I want us to zoom out, right? For us, for our children's trust, and I know for all of you, success looks like a world that's cooling, where we've dropped anthropogenic climate change to the point where Earth's natural systems can begin to correct for the damage that we've done. As we zoom in a little bit closer, what that means is taking approaches to hold governments accountable. Like we're trying to make sure that governments no longer permit this kind of reckless investment in the fossil fuel industry so that we can curtail emissions quickly like Anders shared with us. That's really the solution. And then if you zoom in a little bit closer, in Hawaii, success looks like having a successful greenhouse gas implementation plan in a year that we're sharing not just with the state of Hawaii, but with the states on the West Coast and across the country for a pathway to how to engage in responsible decarbonization that meets the needs of the community. So I think the thing that makes me most excited about where we are today today in our children's trust journey is that we just had this tremendous victory in Montana where we challenged the baseline assumption that in order to be successful as a society, we needed to engage in destructive extractive practices, right? Like coal, gas, oil, and we won. 
And now we've reached this landmark settlement in Hawaii that gives us a clear pathway towards implementation of this victory. So I think we're going to see various stages of success start to roll out. And, you know, as, as I always say, stay tuned for more because we are um, going to be rolling up our sleeves and working very, very hard to make sure that we reach a national tipping point here in the next three to five years because we don't we're running out of time. So I think that brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, and I just really want to say great deep thank yous to all of you for attending. Um, if you have, I think I already said this, but if you have additional questions, please reach out to our development team who will make sure they get answered. You can do that by going to, or to emailing development at our children's trust.org. We have two really big announcements recently about our website. We now have the entire Held v. Montana trial available for viewing on our website, um, along with key documents, uh, key collections of media. You can read about the people um, and places behind the first ever children's climate case to go to trial and win. And then we also have a new section of our website dedicated to the Navahine settlement where you can go sign up to see how you can be a part of this incredible um, implementation plan, which we'll be rolling out in the next you know, several months. So I'd encourage you to go check out our, our website, both the Montana and the Hawaii websites to learn more. Um, I just wanna thank everybody who made this presentation possible. Thank you again, Riley Brook. Thank you, Andrea and Anders for giving us your time today. Um, just really, it's incredible to have you all on the team at our Children's Trust. And for all of those who are behind the scenes with your cameras off, you know, thank you. Thank you, Miyoko. Thank you, Laura, Emily, Aubrey, all of you who make this work possible and who often aren't on center stage. We really appreciate you. Um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us and uh, we will, we'll be in touch.